Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. I begin in the name of God, most compassionate, most merciful. My name is Raheel Raza. I am the president of the Council for Muslims Facing Tomorrow in Canada. I am a doting grandmother and I'm concerned about the future of my children and grandchildren as radical Islam is spreading across North America. So my name is Osama Hassan. I'm an imam from the Quilliam Foundation in London, a counter-extremism think tank. I love my faith of Islam and wish to reclaim it from the extremists. My name is Salma Siddiqui. I'm the president of uh, Coalition of Progressive Muslims Ca Canadians. I'm here to lend my voice to this courageous battle that has been launched for a long time, and today it's taking a movement. I love my faith, and I want my faith back. Thank you. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. My name is Tahir Gora. I am Secretary General of the Coalition of uh, Progressive Canadian Muslim Organizations and also a President of uh, Canadian Thinkers Forum. I'm concerned about safety of my country, which is Canada. I'm Sohail Raza for Muslims Facing Tomorrow Canada. I'm here to take back the narrative of my faith from the people who are destroying it. I'm Arif Humayun, the co-founder of Circle of Peace, which is a grassroots movement, interfaith, uh, grassroots interfaith movement uh, based in Portland, Oregon. I'm here to ensure that we differentiate between the religion of Islam and the political interpretation, and that our children don't fall for the propaganda. I am Hassan Mahmoud, General Secretary of Muslims Facing Tomorrow mm -hmm. Canada. I am here because injustice and violence on any pretext, in any shape, even in the name of God, must stop. Hi, my name is Courtney Lonergan. Uh, I am Muslim, and as a grassroots community organizer, I am very excited to be a part of this movement and work with these amazing people who are the Muslims the world has been waiting for. Good morning and peace to all of you. My name is Muhammad Jibara and I serve as Chief Imam and Resident Scholar at the Cordova Spiritual Education Center in Ottawa. I am here to reclaim the beautiful faith of Islam and its empowering spirit of inclusivity and unconditional love from the criminal syndicates that have hijacked it. My name is Asra Namani. I'm a journalist and I'm a mother. And I am standing here because I believe that we need to have a progressive, forward-thinking interpretation of Islam that represents opening hearts, minds, and doors in our Muslim world. We need to do it for our children, and we need to do it for future generations so that they can live in peace and harmony. And my name is Zudi Jasser. I'm an American, former naval officer. I love my family, and I want to ensure that the legacy I leave for my children is one in which the faith that I love and the country that I love are compatible. Now you've met our new family, which is a family of reformers, reformer Muslim organizations in the West from the United States, Canada, and Europe. We came together in Washington, D.C., have been planning this for months. After years of each of our individual struggles in our own organizations, in which we had our own journeys for addressing the root cause of violent Islamist extremism. This meeting that we've held over the past two days has been a summit, a summit that represents the sunlight from the gathering storm of the conflict within the House of Islam in which our world has now found itself. For years, each one of us, from Portland to Phoenix to Toronto to Ottawa to London to Copenhagen to Morgantown, West Virginia, has been working towards realizing reform and speaking out against Islamist extremism. 
This week we met in this inaugural meeting of a summit of Muslim reformers against the Islamic State and Islamism. While our gathering has been a long time coming, tragedies this year from Paris with the Charlie Hebdo attacks to Sydney to San Bernardino just keep breaking our heart and making our coming together even more and more urgent and important. What's more is that the vacuum created by the failed reform efforts of the Arab awakening has left the West wondering, where are the voices of modernity, freedom, and liberty in the House of Islam? Today, I hope all of you have a copy now, we share with you our declaration for reform. The precepts that we each agreed on and outlined represent a firewall, a strict red line, a firewall that we can help all of those of you who believe in universal human rights. They delineate what all of us agree to be sentinel ideas which provide an unmistakable firewall between the problem, the Islamists and their ideology, or those who believe in political Islam, and the solution, Muslims who believe, such as the ones you'll, you've met today, dedicated to reform with the launch of a new initiative, and we call this initiative the Muslim Reform Movement. A diverse group, a selection and coalition of organizations that came together as a Muslim Reform Movement. Today, these reformers have introduced yourself, and now we'll each read a piece of the declaration that we all signed. And we welcome you to find us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Our hashtag for this is Muslim Reform. We'll take this declaration and post it on the doors of the mosques in our towns. We ask Muslims that agree to sign it on change.org and to join us and posting it on their mosques in their town. A group of the Muslims behind me will walk to the uh, mosque on uh, Massachusetts Avenue, uh, which uh, has uh, significant uh, Saudi influence. And uh, we will ask that the uh, mosques respond to these declarations. If they reject them, then we know they're on the side of the problem. If they accept them as needed reforms, we know that they're part of our movement and part of the solution. So without further ado, our new reform family will start reading to you our declaration. Declaration for Muslim Reform Movement. We are Muslims who live in the 21st century. We stand for a respectful, merciful, and inclusive interpretation of Islam. We are in a battle for the soul of Islam. And an Islamic renewal must defeat the ideology of Islamism, or political Islam, which seeks to create Islamic states, as well as a caliphate. We seek to reclaim the progressive spirit with which Islam was born in the seventh century, to fast forward it into the 21st century. We support the Universal Declaration of Human Rights which was adopted by United Nations member states in 1948. We reject interpretations of Islam that call for a violent jihad, social injustice, and political Islam. Facing the threat of terrorism, intolerance, and social injustice in the name of Islam, we have reflected on how we can transform our communities based on three principles, peace, human rights, and secular governance. We are announcing today the formation of our international initiative, the Muslim Reform Movement. We have courageous reformers from around the world who will outline our declaration for Muslim reform, a living document that, will continue to, that we will continue to enhance as our journey continues. We invite our fellow Muslims and neighbors to join us. Firstly, under peace, national security, counter-terrorism, and foreign policy. We stand for universal peace, love, and compassion. We reject violent jihad. We believe we must target the ideology of violent Islamist extremism in order to liberate individuals, both in Muslim-majority societies and the West, from the scourge of oppression and terrorism. We stand for the protection of all people of all faiths and non-faiths who seek freedom from dictatorships, theocracies, and Islamic extremists.
We reject bigotry, oppression, and violence against all people based on any prejudice, including ethnicity, gender, language, religion, sexual orientation, and gender expression. We stand for human rights and justice. We support equal rights and dignity for all people, including minorities. We support the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, reject the so-called Cairo Declaration of Human Rights in Islam. We reject tribalism, castes, monarchies, and patriarchies, and consider all people equal with no birth rights other than human rights. All human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. Muslims don't have a monopoly on heaven. We support equal rights for women, including equal rights to inheritance, witness, work, mobility, personal law, education, and employment. Men and women have equal rights in mosques, boards, leadership, and all spheres of society. We reject sexism and misogyny. We are for secular governance, democracy, and liberty. We are against polit political movements in the name of religion. We separate mosque and state. We are loyal to the nations in which we live. We reject the idea of Islamic state. There is no need for an Islamic caliphate. We oppose Sharia as law. Sharia is man-made. We believe in life, in joy, free speech, and beauty all around us. Every individual has the right to publicly express criticism of any interpretation of Islam. Ideas do not have rights. Human beings have rights. We reject blasphemy laws, which are a mask to restrict the freedom of speech and religion. We affirm every individual's right to critical thinking and seek a revival of ijtihad. We believe in the freedom of religion and the right of all people to express and practice their faith or non-faith without threat of violence, persecution, or discrimination. Apostasy is not a crime. Our ummah, our community, is all of humanity and not just Muslims. We stand for peace, human rights, and secular governance. Please stand with us. Thank you. That's our declaration. Each of our organizations will take it back to the mosques, to the communities. We ask you to present them to Muslims who have been doing the press releases against radical Islam, against violence, and see where they stand on the reforms necessary to counter the root causes. Thank you. This is our Muslim reform movement. Uh, we're open to questions, uh, and uh, we're at your disposal. So thank you for joining us in this effort that has been a long time coming and has meant so much to all of us working so hard to get here. Thank you, all of you. Thanks. We'll, take, <laughs> we'll take any questions that you have and to direct it to anybody. Do you anticipate any blowback? What, what are you bracing for if you say we go to the same way to the Islamic Center? You're looking, at, you're looking at leaders of organizations that have been taking blowback for over 10 years that we've been doing this. So. Uh, collective blowback is easier <laughs> than individual blowback. And um, listen, uh, our, our critics try to label everything that's been listed here as uh, so-called Islamophobia. Uh, I think you'll realize that this is coming from Muslims that love their faith. Uh, so they're certainly not going to be able to uh, put that onto us. And ultimately, I'll let others speak to uh, 
what happens. I think blowback is those who are afraid of reform or are afraid to lose power. And ultimately, this is about freedom. It's about the American and Western fight for and against for freedom and against theocracy. Uh, so uh, that's natural. Uh, but the blowback really is small compared to what our families fighting for freedom in Syria and all over the world uh, uh, can suffer. So this is the least we can do to own this problem. Imam Hassan. Throughout history, reform has never been easy. If you look at all the great religious and uh, political reformers in history, and as people of faith, you know, we think of, of Jesus Christ, or of Moses, of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon them all, of, of Gandhi, Martin Luther King, uh, Martin Luther before that. Uh, reform has never been easy. There, there is always resistance. Uh, but as Shakespeare says, or as Iqbal says, or Rumi says, uh, you know, you need a, a, an opposing wind to fly higher to soar higher like the American eagle. So we are expecting opposition. That's all part of the de debate and dynamism of reform. But we are confident that uh, our values are, are rooted in the core Quranic and Islamic teachings of, of compassion, uh, kindness, love, and mercy, uh, which are the, the real spirit of Islam. And that will win out in the end because love conquers hatred. Mercy and compassion overcome anger. And we will get there uh, in the end, God willing. Excellently said. In fact, that's the, the main problem that we suffer from, is that not only has our faith been hijacked in its image and the media, the way that people are presenting, people who are standing, speaking in the name of our faith, are misrepresenting it, but what we suffer from most is that the terminologies have been hijacked, that the terminologies, what, what words mean in the Qur'an, the words, the meaning of the words has been changed, so the connotation and denotation has been changed. So b words like sharia, ah, jihad, which originally were positive concepts that promoted love, that promoted free thinking, because sharia ah in its, in its, uh, as a concept, as, a, as an idea, as a philosophy, uh, aims to liberate the human mind from being restricted, because sharia ah is about letting go of the restrictions and taking a person from a narrow mindset to a broad mindset, to be inclusive instead of being exclusive, I instead of being restricted within a, a, a frame of worldview, but rather that it should be changing from time to time, considering circumstances, etc. And, and Sharia is not about penal code. 
the way that it is presented by certain people. Sharia is how we as people of faith can understand our faith in the changing circumstances, uh, you know, how we interact with others. And its foundation, as the Quran tells, is a adlin ihsan, which is a foundation upon balance, upon balanced justice, upon equitable justice, upon love, mercy, kindness, beauty. If it is not beautiful, if it is not just, if it is not kind, if it is not inclusive, it is not sharia, it is not Islam. It's that simple. And we need to reclaim these terms, we need to reclaim Islam, we need to reclaim all of these words that have been misinterpreted. And par this is a, a, a part of the root reason of the problem. This is the root cause, is that this language has been hijacked. So when Muslims go to read the Quran, they are reading it with the with this tainted vocabulary, and then they're misunderstanding it. And this is part of what we want to do, is, yes. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so what I would just add is that what we are hoping to do is, in fact, reclaim so much of the progressive spirit that we believe Islam came to on this earth in the seventh century, and go back to that same spirit and bring it forward so that we have concepts like issues of women's rights that we're stuck in seventh century context. And now, for example, with this issue of inheritance, while women did not receive inheritance in the sixth century and then they received inheritance in the seventh century, we believe now that it should be equal inheritance. And so there's so many concepts like this that we wish to find as forward thinking. If I, one thing to add on the, uh, um, the man-made issue, the reason we all agreed to that is, as you can see, any reclamation involves men and women reclaiming. So that's an act of man. Sharia, as, as a concept, the word is even hard to find in the Quran. So that's the issue, is that if it was so important, when men and women discuss it, it's on earth. It's man-made versus actually, unless you know, God comes down and says, this is it, the only definition we know of what his message is is in the Quran itself. So. I will introduce myself. My name is Nasa Kara. I'm a member of the Danish parliament. Uh, <clears throat> and I have been a democratic Muslim activist for many years uh, in, uh, in, in Denmark. It's not, it's not easy to do this. Uh, I know that uh, my experience from Denmark, uh, you know, we have uh, very, very strong op uh, opponents. Uh, in Western Europe, we are up against uh, an unholy alliance between uh, the Islamists and the liberals. L the liberals uh, uh, say that uh, people like me and us, we are not real Muslims. The real Muslims are the Islamists, and that's what uh, we want to challenge. Uh, and it's necessary to do this uh, step, very necessary, because Islam is in a big crisis right now. Uh, a lot of violence and terror committed in the name of Islam, and it's very important that we reject that, condemn uh, this. So, and uh, we also ask the Muslims to, when anybody do terror in the name of Islam, we have to all to condemn it. There's a lot of, in my opinion, too much silence when uh, terror attack are committed, like in uh, Paris uh, two, three weeks ago. Afterwards, I was in uh, the Middle East, and I asked people, what do you think about this terror attack? Uh, uh, few people uh, condemned it. Uh, a lot of people had a lot of theories uh, why that uh, happened. <laughs> and now the West have to taste their own medicine and so on. And we reject this, so it's important for the, for Islam, for the mainstream Muslims, 
but also for the Western societies that they know that a lot of people who are Muslims, who are democratic, who will fight for peace, and who will work for a revolution of Islam, it's very needed. You mentioned the term Islamophobia. Uh, that is used to shut up conversation. Now, the, we are Muslims, and this is why we call this the Muslim Reform Movement, because we cannot be slapped with the label of Islamophobia. We're speaking from within the faith, from a love of the faith. And when there is a disease or a virus, it can't be treated unless you identify the problem. So unless we call the problem for what it is, which is one of the extremely important notions that we have talked about, unless we identify the problem, narrow it down, we won't be able to treat it. So we have to call it what it is, and it is violent, radical, extremist Islamism. And if I could add one thing to the question about, when you asked about, you called it Islamophobia, we will recognize that in the West there is a, a growing amount of fear of some bigotry towards Muslims. So how do you address that? We believe that the best way that that be squelched, it's like a hunger, there's an appetite to hear Muslims that want to take ownership and be moderate and reformist. That appetite, if it's not filled, turns into starvation, turns into anger. So the best treatment for that is for Americans and, West and Europeans and Canadians and people all over the world to see that Muslims are taking ownership and that the solution, if it's going to come within, needs to engage us in a positive, tough love, if you will, rather than in one that antagonizes. Uh, so ultimately, I think this is the best treatment for that problem, which is a reaction to a lack of positive response, not just against the acts of terror, but Muslims addressing the root causes. Just to add on to these comments of my colleagues, uh, terrorism affects us all. We all go through airports, through all these special check-ins, we fly, uh, and we have the same concern. So it's not an Islamic problem per se, it's a global problem, and we invite you all, all of our neighbors in, around the world to also join us in having a discussion. And once we discuss things, explain things, and, uh, and discuss the counter point of view, that's when we can understand where the real things are. Well, as a Muslim living in America, I can see where uh, the ideology of uh, a, political, a politicalized uh, interpretation of Islam has caused this extremism. I see the ideology in the mosques, in conversations between Muslims. I see that there is a problem, and we are standing up to address that. And this change and shift needs to happen within Muslim communities. As Muslims, we see that there is a problem with other people that are holding, that say that they hold the same faith as us, but we see what the distinction is. And in our declaration, we have created that line so that we can see who are the people who are ready to embrace humanity and who are the people who are bent on this politicalized, uh, supremist movement of world domination so that we can uh, end this injustice uh, now. I think it's justified because as a Muslim community, we have not addressed this. I see where this extreme rhetoric comes from. I've, I've witnessed it firsthand in communities with youth who have a loss of identity that are searching for something. There is def definitely this victim mindset uh, that has been perpetuated within the Muslim communities that allows for this type of thinking. And it's important now for the Muslim leaders to stand up and address this and not be apologetic and not say that because people are biased that there's no reason that we need to address it. There is a problem. Let me tell you a story about your question. I was traveling from Portland to Chicago about five, six years ago. 
and the guy sitting next to me was a physician who was Jewish. So we discussed for about two, two and a half hours all the world problems. And then he said, what, where, are you, where, are you, where, where are you coming from? Where do you live? I said, in the US. Well, what's your region, original country of birth? I said, Pakistan. Oh, you're a Muslim? I said, yes. Yeah. I don't want to talk to you. But that's your choice. I said, I could say the same thing. It so happened, that was the day, I think it was Yom Kippur or Rosh Hashanah, and her daughter was fasting with a Jewish friend of hers in middle school. So I said, this is the sort of people we are. He felt so ashamed of what he said to me. Then we landed in Chicago, and I was going to London, so I had a layover there. He invited me to come, come to his home and have a meal with him. And I said, I don't have the time, but then when he came back to Portland, we had a meal together. So you have to talk about things, discuss things to resolve them. I think uh, the media can play a very important role in this. The fact that we are not, like when you go out and talk to the Islamist, the groups who are just coming up with uh, a press release after maybe 10 days condemning uh, what is happening, that is past. And we see so much time given to them and their messages, reson well, this, it's not resonating, but like the fact is, it's reaching the young Muslims. So the media also owes, uh, 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 does need to be responsible in that and you know, protect, uh, uh, join our movement to say we are there for America, Canada, for humanity all around the world. So uh, I think this uh, movement today, hopefully we can come back next year and see where you have been our partners, and we will call on that. Thank you. <coughs> yeah, if I can add a view from Europe, um, of course we had 9-11 many years ago here. We had our 9-11 in London 10 years ago in 2005. Uh, but this year, I've, I've noticed after the Charlie Hebdo attacks and the more recent uh, Paris terror attacks, uh, that the public mood has, has really become quite dangerous in terms of uh, fear and suspicion of Muslims. For the first time I've seen, uh, you know, London Underground and the public transport system, veiled women being uh, intimidated, uh, abused. The, the uh, recorded cases shot up uh, three times, 300% uh, after the latest terror attacks. Uh, and, and it's partly because of the activities of the so-called Islamic State. Uh, over the last year, a lot of people are now, uh, who may not know much about religion, may not know many Muslims, they associate Islam with these beheadings and uh, uh, awful atrocities which they see uh, on the media. So uh, I, I think it's becoming more and more dangerous, uh, and London is possibly one of the more tolerant um, and diverse multicultural places in Europe. I think it's much worse in other parts of, of Western Europe. And uh, that's why Muslims really have to stand up and stop peddling a victimhood narrative uh, that it's, all, it's always somebody else's fault. It's, it's the West or it's the media or it's Israel or something. They, you have to take ownership of your own problem. And in fact, all the great religions teach that. Uh, you know, look, at, look into why are you looking at the plank in your, uh, sorry, the moat in your brother's eye and, and not the plank in your own eye, for example. Uh, you have to start from within and purify within. I think we all agree that Muslims have to take ownership of this problem, uh, address those uh, extremist ideologies which are based on a supremacist worldview uh, of Muslim domination around the world, the idea that only we are victims uh, as Muslims, which is nonsense, of course, because there are Christians, Jews, Buddhists, Hindus, atheists um, uh, all around the world, Shias, Ahmadis, who are also persecuted. So we do not have a monopoly on, on heaven, as we said. We don't have a monopoly on being victims either. And, uh, and that's a very immature uh, discourse. I think we have to show courage as Muslims and mature our discourse to say we believe in the, the civilized values of the modern world, which are a combination of all the major world religions and philosophies. And uh, I believe Islam was a major civilizing factor to the world over the last 14 centuries, as were Christianity and Judaism and all the major world religions. And we have to be part of that coalition of civilizations, if you like, against very uncivilized people who wish to destroy the modern world, who reject modern ideas such as universal human rights, gender equality, uh, separation of religion and state, uh, for example, and wish to take us back to uh, theocratic fascism, if you like. Uh, so uh, it is becoming more urgent in terms of the, the public mood, but I think uh, cometh the hour cometh the men and women, and uh, we are here. Thank you.
Um, we absolutely believe that there is a problem with the interpretation of Islam that has been exported to the world from the government of Saudi Arabia. We have seen Islam become a regressive interpretation because of so many of the sexist, intolerant, and even violent interpretations that the Saudi government has exported over the last four decades in a multi-billion dollar industry that has sadly made it so that today we have this need for a reformation because we are challenging so many of those dramatic and inhumane interpretations. This is uh, one of the reasons why we believe that we have to stand up for issues of law and issues of, uh, of secular governance because we don't want to have these types of interpretations become issues of public policy. We see beheadings, we see forced veils, we see all sorts of interpretations that are not part of the progressive spirit of Islam. And the Saudi government, unfortunately, has become a symbol and also a manufacturer of so much of the problem that we have in our communities today. Also, we feel that uh, <clears throat> we Muslims being living in the West uh, should be talking to our governments over here so that uh, we could uh, uh, pressurize Saudi government to stop funding to radical mosques. And there should be end of funding, uh, end of foreign funding to, to mosques anyway. And that's what our uh, goal is. And it's very important. I can just add one thing on Saudi. There's an individual by the name of Rafe Bedawi who's been in prison uh, for what they call apostasy. If he was free, we would have made sure he was standing with us. Uh, he's a Muslim who loves his faith, started an organization called Free Saudi Liberals, and has won almost every award that you can think of in the West for journalism, and yet still remains in a prison in a country that's our so-called ally because he loves his faith, but the government believes he's an apostate. And that is at the core of the problem, is that West, the West needs to stand up for our ideals, as our document says, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And sometimes, too often, because of diplomacy and other issues, we allow the cancers to spread. And all the while, the, the clinics of, that create the ISISs of the world are being allowed to spread their ideology through money. And Saudi's not the only source. It includes many of the petromonarchies of Qatar, uh, sources from Al-Azhar, et cetera. The ideas that you see on this document come out that we're countering come out from a lot of these sources. Um, I want to add one other thing, which is when the media reports about bigotry against Muslims that exist, we want you to report the truth. I mean, we would stand uh, today, and I think many of us agree, that what happened in France with the shuttering of three mosques, if, if they were preaching violence, we would call for, their, for uh, um, that to be shut down. But if they're preaching hate, et cetera, you counter those ideas by pitting us against them to counter their ideas, not by shutting them down. That moves them underground. It prevents the debate that we need to have. That's why we're taping these on the mosques. We want to have this debate. You push it underground, we can't have the debate. So that's part of the dysfunction that happens. But also, if you exaggerate Muslim victimhood, the media then contributes to radicalization. That is one of the primary, and this is one of the things I think Quilliam and other organizations have done so well, is to show radicalization starts, press TV and other foreign media use those ideas to then begin to radicalize Muslims against the West. Time has come to challenge uh, Saudi, not only the government of Saudi, but also uh, a lot of princes in Saudi who uh, sponsor uh, a lot of uh, uh, Islamist, jihadist uh, organizations. Uh, that will be part of our job to ask our government to challenge uh, the Saudis. We should act uh, at Saudis uh, as we did. The Western Europe and the US did with Uganda uh, when they made a law uh, on uh, homosexuality. There was a firm action 
against uh, Uganda. But when it comes to Saudi, everybody's afraid of Saudi because they have a lot of money. So we should uh, challenge uh, our government to challenge the Saudis and treat them as we did with Uga Uganda. I'll take you back to the first question we had about blowback. This is our blowback. This is our reaction. And this is our fight. And there's uh, nobody standing here who hasn't had a threat up to and including death. So we've overcome that. And it's now our turn to have them dance to our tune and face the challenge. On the issue of uh, Saudi Arabia also, one of the great issues that we face is that if anybody thinks outside of the ideology that the government of Saudi Arabia wants to impose on others, we are called apostates. And so individuals like Roif Badawi, Ashraf Fayyad, a poet right now, are in jail and sentenced for the crime of being blasphemous and being apostates. And this is unacceptable. People we have um, emphasized the importance of critical thinking, and this is what we want to allow in our Muslim communities and in our world so that we can have an open discussion of ideas. So, uh, I understand it's very kind of conscious. <coughs> Muslim people actually are giving a very strong sense of uh, crisis right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, I imagine that after September 11th, uh, we felt the same kind of uh, sense of crisis. Is it the same feeling, or is it different? Is different? How different uh, compared to your 14 years ago? Um, I think the Arab awakening changed everything, and uh, I, like the fight has been going on for long. September 11th, it was a start, but as things have progressed. Uh, it has come, become a crisis for sure, as you say. And uh, we have to stop it because it's happening every day. And Saudi Arabia uh, and Qatar and others uh, have been contributing to this. So I think uh, the crisis is real, and it's time that we all got together and act, rea react to that. Thank you. Well, over a thousand years ago, the scholars of Islam taught us that everything begins in the mind. So if you can convince people to adopt ideas that are exclusive, that are oppressive, that are hateful, that are intolerant, that eventually these ideas can, with time, they will gradually be established and realized in reality. And that is exactly what we are here to oppose and reclaim our faith because we have been speaking about these things forever. And we've had scholars, major Islamic scholars, who have spoken out against these ideologies and these ideas, warning the people that this is what will result from that. It's not just going to remain a theory, that these theories will eventually be realized in practice. So to just deal with the with the problem that's at hand is like putting a bandage over the problem without dealing with the root causes. So it's always going to resurface. So it's essential that we seek the roots of the problem and heal the problem at its root causes to ensure that it does not resurface again. Can I just add one of the big differences with 9-11 uh, uh, is of course we've had the war on terror since then. Um, and listening to President Hollande of France uh, over the last month saying France is at war against ISIS, etc., and our government also in Britain, reminded me of George W. Bush after 9-11, you know, we're at war, etc. And of course, uh, Al-Qaeda was defeated in Afghanistan, but uh, now controls more territory elsewhere and spawned off ISIS in the last uh, 14 years, which is even more deadly uh, than Al-Qaeda. And I think that confirms the point we've all been making and one of my colleagues made yesterday at the Heritage Foundation, I think it was Nasser in Denmark, he said, we have to bomb ISIS ideology as well with counter-arguments, with be better arguments. 
because bad ideas are defeated by better ideas, not by shutting them down. And we are ready to take on every single uh, so-called interpretation that the extremists bring, which they, which they misquote from the Quran, the Hadith, uh, the, the Sharia jurisprudence, etc. Uh, and we are ready to answer every single one based on the agreed upon fundamental principles of Islam and the Quran, which are mercy, compassion, truth, justice, beauty, all of these positive, wonderful, shared human values. Um, otherwise, we will lose this battle because you, you cannot bomb an ideology out of existence, as we've been saying at Quilliam for, for eight years. Uh, you can bomb people and places, you can't bomb an ideology. Uh, we have to do that uh, on the ideational level, conceptual level, you know, with theology, with jurisprudence, and with uh, proper spiritual Muslim behavior. Why now? It's because the jihadist movement are stronger than ever, you know, and they attract a lot of young people. You see, in Western Europe, in Denmark, we have around 100 to 150 in uh, fighting with Islamic State in uh, Syria and Iraq. Uh, France had a, lo uh, a lot of people, young people, United Kingdom, and so on. And uh, we have never seen that before, so strong they are. And they have become very hot among the young people. It's hard to be a part of it. And that's a big challenge for us. I, I hear uh, some young people say they love their uniforms. <laughs> and the way they cut the head of uh, other people, it, it attracts some, uh, some young people. And that's why it's necessary to do this step. Also because the Muslim communities uh, in the Muslim world and in the Western world, uh, you know, they have a collective denial of a big problem. And we have to tell them that uh, stop this denial. We are in big trouble. We have to act now. Well, uh, this is just the first step. This is our declaration. And we know that many more Muslims will join us. And those that oppose us, we will engage in dialogue. This is going to be a journey. This is going to be work. And we are ready to be on the front lines and discuss and, and uh, bring love forth to our faith and to our fellow Muslims. Each of us here from Canada, Europe, and America are going to take this to our partners. And please make sure that the tipping point has been reached. There's no more violence that we can tolerate. And you as a community, and you as the press, and we as Muslims. So it's now. This is the urgent time. So we are going to take this declaration back to wherever we are uh, living, and we are going to propagate it. And then like Zudi said, we are going to meet next year. And hopefully, we'll have a full house. Uh, in conclusion, I'd like to remind everyone that, <coughs> excuse me, that we are initiating this reformation on the foundation of love. <coughs> we love our faith, we love our people, and we love the people of the world. We want to see the people of the world go forth in love and compassion, and to put an end to all this hatred and this division. We want, we want this to be founded upon love, because that is what brings life to the heart, to the mind, and to the soul of any people. Hallelujah. <laughs> My two pennies. By now, it uh, should be pretty clear to towards non-Muslims, that we Muslims are the first and primary victims of radical Islam. But trust me, we are not the last one. If we do not collectively defeat this devil, ultimately, you will be affected too and your generations. So let us come closer and let us work together against the devil. Um. Two last words and we'll close. Uh, I want to thank all of you for coming. Uh, Ezra is going to close us, but use this declaration as a tool. 
people say, how do we vet refugees? How do we know, you know, who's the solution, who's a problem? This is the tool. And it's not about non-Muslims debating this. Get Muslims to debate this issue. And this will allow the growth to happen and the modernization to happen uh, within. Uh, so uh, our country needs to begin to have a conversation about Islamism. It's not just about calling it, okay, what happens once you call it? You start to have a conversation to develop a strategy on how to deal with it, and we want to be part of that strategy. We want to see it at the table. And it's not just my voice, not just Ezra's, all of our voices, and there's many who couldn't come here. So um, we have not had a seat at the table like we should in the discussion of Islam in the public sphere. And uh, that's really what this is all about. Ezra? So I want to thank all of you for the courage that you have in your hearts because what does define all of us is a love of this world and a service to humanity. And this is ultimately the greater mission for each one of us in all of our lives. And what we will now do is set forth into the world. We will go and we will post our declaration for Muslim reform on the doors of our mosque here on Massachusetts Avenue. It is a symbol of the Reformation, and the Reformation has begun. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.